Have it your way. Expel Hello and welcome back to Wish for Death Island, Population Me. Today we're back on the Harry Potter train with the fourth book. This one was kind of special to me for some reason. It was my favourite when I was growing up, for some reason. I guess it's because of the tournament? Anyways, I stopped working on my chibi comic for this, so let's get to it. Also a reminder that I sent off the first month's happy mail and arcane mail is coming in May, if you're interested. More info in the description. The book begins with a chapter about a man called Frank in a small village, and the stigmatized property known as the Riddle House that is now abandoned. This is where Voldemort grew up and he killed his folks because he's evil. The little Hangletons all agree that the old house was creepy. Here we go with rolling style of description. <laughs> you already started describing how the house was creepy, so you could have just said it was avoided or stigmatized. But you'll notice in this book, as well as the parentheses, again, she also does this thing where she successfully does describe a certain emotion or atmosphere. And then like Harry, for instance, will immediately come in and be like, Harry noticed the thing that he wanted to explain to the audience. Her maid had come in one day when the riddles still lived there and noticed that all of them were dead. So she runs out screaming, lying there with their eyes open, cold as ice, still in their dinner things. I assume that means they were wearing bacon when they died. The riddles were described as basically the Dursleys too. And Tom Riddle himself was a bit of a cunt. There was a man named Frank who worked for the Riddles as a disgruntled war vet, so he was immediately arrested, even though there was no mark or DNA on any of the victims of the house. They just needed to arrest someone, basically, until they had to let him go because they didn't have the evidence. It's weird to think that Frank did anything, though, according to the villagers, because he just wants a quiet life. The villagers speculate and they decide that maybe Frank did do it because the key was hanging by his door and he's always on the property. But once the report from the bodies came back, that solidified that they had no evidence on Frank. We're on the second page and there's already an unnecessary parenthesis. <laughs> Why is it here? If you want to make a statement, make it in the sentence or make another sentence about it. I don't know, it doesn't fucking matter. Don't puss out with the parentheses, it shouldn't be there. This also shows that some of the spells, to muggle eyes at least, have absolutely no trace on the body at all. I wonder how it does work then. How does magic work besides just kind of doing the thing and then disappearing to muggles? This really does seem like they just used like a delete spell for their souls to leave their bodies. The villagers basically think that they were frightened to death, which means that for them it would appear like all their hearts stopped somehow. It just kind of makes me question things on the wizard side though, like wizard forensics basically don't exist until Rowling wants them to, so how would they know if someone had been killed using the killing curse? Because as far as this series is concerned, there really isn't any sort of forensic procedure. What a waste of a cool concept. Frank was let go because there was no evidence, so he went to take care of the abandoned house once again because he doesn't know anything else. Frank then wakes up in the present time because he hears and sees things in the house. There's a disturbance. He sees some lights in the window and assumes that hooligans are back. Frank limped around the back of the house until he reached a door almost completely hidden by Ivy, took out an old key, put it into the lock, and opened the door noiselessly. That is a hell of a cram sentence. You know what, I take back what I said before rolling. If this is what you're gonna do without parentheses, I, I still don't think you need them, but I do think that you need another option. When you put too many things in a sentence like this, I feel like it always just looks more like a list than a sentence. Like, this is the type of shit that I type when I want to come back to it later and try to figure it out. He goes to the kitchen. Ladies and gentlemen, may I bring you the longest sentence in the fucking world. Frank had not entered it for many years. Nevertheless, although it was very dark, he remembered where the door into the hall was, and he groped his way towards it, his nostrils full of the smell of decay, his ears pricked for any second of footsteps or voices from overhead. One of my writing teachers when I was in university once told me that if you can't read a sentence out loud in one breath, it may be too long. The nevertheless, although, Makes me really question whether or not she even read through the sentence after she typed it because of the two semicolons. All of this to say that he still remembers the house because he worked there for so long and now it's old and mossy and abandoned. Frank goes and sees there are people inside so he keeps himself hidden and listens into what they're doing. It's Voldemort for us, the audience, but to him it's just some random guy. 
It's Voldemort in fetus form, I should say, and Wormtail, the rat. They're going to stay here for a week until the Quidditch World Cup because they're going to intercept it and do some fuckery as per usual. They also still have their plan to fuck up Harry Potter and destroy his fun school year as per usual. But it's still very complicated to defeat a stupid teenager that stays with muggles and wanders around by himself for multiple months of the year. He's not allowed to do magic, you could just like, shoot him. Society of the Pigeon Milkers. I understand Frank doesn't know wizard words, but Rowling decides that I don't and she needs to tell me. <laughs> Your lordship is still determined then. What a fucking stupid question. Fucking Wormtail rat. Laying hands on Harry Potter would be so difficult. He is so well protected. No, he isn't! He's left alone multiple months a year and still manages to just get out of trouble using Tard Rage. That school will kill him first because of how dangerous it is, because of how long it'll take you guys to figure out that he's not allowed to use magic in the non wizarding world, so you could just like stab him. So <laughs> invite him to Florida and just stab him. This is what he gets for being bald. They also had taken someone from the Ministry when she was on holiday, and he took information out of her and put some sort of plan into place before killing her. Since she belonged to the Ministry, they need to monitor the situation and not kill anyone just yet in case people try to find her. Honestly though, the Ministry is so stupid, what could they do anyway? You'll see in the book later, they don't bother looking for this bitch until like months later because they just don't give a shit. Never mind she's a government worker and probably knows a few things. They straight up do not care that someone went missing. Wormtail is like, we didn't have to kill her. I mean, you did. But then Voldemort says, memory charms can be broken by a powerful wizard. You think maybe there's wizards you can hire to make memory charms like under the table or like take out memory charms under the table? Like the black market mafia shit, like where's the mafia wizard? Is there any way to actually completely wipe someone's memory or is it just reversible? Unless you kill him. Frank then witnesses Nagini, the snake, come in and comes to the conclusion that Voldemort is talking to the snake and that somehow someone is gonna die. Voldemort says he has servants at Hogwarts and he's gonna help murder Harry this year because of their special plan that doesn't really need to exist. Frank didn't understand what was going on. Same Frank. But the snake comes up behind Frank and then he had the snake told Voldemort that Frank was there so now they're gonna kill him. So he walks into the room and immediately starts yelling that he's going to the police because that wouldn't want to make them kill him faster or anything. But after he says he's going to the police, Wormtail turns the chair so that Frank can see Fetus Deletus who kills him and then Harry wakes up from a nightmare. Harry's nightmare of course was the events that were going on but of course he doesn't know that they were real. Only thing that he knows is that his head hurts. He sat up, one hand still on his scar, the other reaching out in the darkness for his glasses which were on the bedside table. Rolling, please split your sentences. She also makes an ice cube comparison with fear and like that's not bad but I feel like that's also just like a placeholder for something else. A lot of like, I guess I've been reading way too much Chuck Palahniuk which I mean I always do. I feel like a lot of these sentences are just like placeholders for something else. Also as he recounts his dream he also like says stuff like and then he harry like like he's dio what's up with that i dio will create an empire of rat milk for umbrella corporation on the floor beside his bed a book lay open harry had been reading it before he fell asleep last night we know we can tell it's on the floor because he was reading it he also goes on to say that quidditch is the best sport in the wizarding world i mean i guess so but it seems like the only sport in the wizarding world harry tries to brush off his nightmare but actually just can't do it because he has this feeling that it's real and he remembers that his scar only really hurts when there's some fuckery going on. Then makes you think that maybe he should be thinking about it a bit more. He was used to bizarre incidents and injuries. They were unavoidable if you attended Hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry. Safe regulations? Never heard of her. Dumbledore no likey. He only wants student murder. Are all wizard schools death traps? He then recaps his living situation and points out they were muggles who hated and despised magic in any form. Hated and despised, both very useful words to include at this time. Very needed and necessary. Harry wasn't allowed to use magic outside of Hogwarts, but they were still apt to blame him for anything that went wrong around the house. Because you've shown that you have weird, wild, like, psychic magic that you can't control and apparently other magic people do the same thing but it somehow partially disappears when you're at Hogwarts for no real reason but for you it still happens, like, every single book. I mean, I don't like the Dursleys but they have a point. 
So he stays awake for a while and decides that he won't tell anyone because it's a stupid dream and his skull hurt, but that's really all he had, and he didn't want to worry his friends. That, I understand. But then he remembers that he can tell Dumbledore, who specifically told him that he should let him know about these things because of the, like, the scar hurt means that something bad's happening. So he writes a letter in his head and thinks it sounds stupid so he can't do it. The letter says, Dear Professor Dumbledore, Sorry to bother you, but my scar hurt this morning. Yours sincerely, Harry. Let, let me fix that for you. Dear Professor, after Wormtail escaped last year, my scar started giving me issues and I had a very vivid dream about them plotting to kill me. Normally, it would just be a dream, but my scar was hurting and it seems to only happen when there's a real danger involved. It happened when I woke up, so I thought I'd tell you because it seemed important. Try that. He puts that aside and remembers that the Weasleys wanted to invite him to the sports ball event this year, and Rowling informs us of this with parentheses. It's so important that it actually becomes part of the plot because he goes there later, but that doesn't matter, just put it in some brackets. He also feels like he needs a parent because he's an orphan, and he feels ashamed to admit it because that makes him feel silly. And I do think this is incredibly important for his character. I wish that this was brought up more because it seems like something that you really is important to his development as a person, as someone who's growing up in an abusive household without their parents and just found out that the one person in the world who is technically his family is like on the run because of the incompetent government. So they feel like they have to like hide all the time. That's really sad and I feel like it would fuck him up and I'm really happy that she at least mentioned it because I feel like it just doesn't exist all the, all the other time. Harry leapt up from his bed, hurried across the room and sat down at his desk. He pulled a piece of parchment towards him, loaded his eagle feather quill with ink, wrote Dear Sirius, then paused, wondering how to best phrase his problem, still marveling at the fact that he hadn't thought of Sirius right away. That sentence hurts my soul. That is the most mechanical, unnecessary sentence ever. You could have had like a nice paragraph done neatly, but you just crammed it into a checklist. He writes out stuff for Sirius and then pauses and leaves at his desk to finish later. And that's good. Sirius needs to know these things. Yet Sirius had been innocent. Murders for which he had been committed had been committed by Wormtail. Because the Wizarding World doesn't have forensics or any sort of actual crime unit that's useful, you could argue that they want Sirius in jail because they're corrupt, and I want to believe that. I do go into this later that I do think that this is a thing that Rowling is trying to go for, but I think in order to do that you need a kind of working government in the first place, but the ministry is just useless anyway. You could tell me that the espionage and sabotage and normal workday uh, like the same thing because I wouldn't notice anything out of the ordinary because of how incompetent it is. Wormtail had escaped before they could take him to the Ministry of Magic, but you have Dumbledore as a witness and you can get a fucking manhunt going for him right now. They mentioned four points as well, which is a spell that they used to point them in the direction of something like Google Maps, and they mentioned this later on. I think they mentioned it in the the last trial as well, so you might only see it in the second part of this this review. It's basically Google Maps, and I know it has to be from like a certain range, but couldn't they try and use it for a manhunt? Because Ron would have the rat DNA all over his stuff from the years that it's lived with him, so they could use it to like somehow do something if they had wizard forensics. How else do they solve crimes? Nevertheless, Sirius had been of some help to Harry, even if he couldn't be with him. It was due to Sirius that Harry now had all his school things in his room with him. I don't understand the idea that students can't practice spells outside of Hogwarts unless it's homework, and then they immediately get found out if they do a spell and get the ministry like to teleport an owl to their house like five minutes afterwards. Yet, they also can't seem to track owls that send letters. Like, if Harry is getting owls from mysterious places, they don't track it. Why don't they track it as well? Like, if their agenda is to, like, keep tabs on Harry to see if they can find Sirius? Because Sirius escaped, so they're still freaking out about Sirius, aren't they? Last year they were freaking out about Harry all the time, shouldn't they still be? Maybe if someone could send him a fucking pipe bomb or something? And because of how little people intercept the wizard mail? Why hasn't Voldemort tried that? Make a pipe bomb. Don't even get me started on the fact that he's vulnerable the entire time he's in the muggle world, again. <laughs> He's magicless, and the people who hate him can just, like, appear at any moment. So Harry told the Dursleys that he has a serial killer for a godfather, and the Dursleys are scared now. Cool. But then, in parentheses, Rowling brings up the fact that the letters could be intercepted. That doesn't explain anything about why the Ministry hasn't caught on yet. Besides the Ministry being fucking stupid, which kind of 
undermines the entire plot about them being controlled by the Death Eaters or something. This is like Schrodinger's rules, they just show up when you need them. Harry goes down to breakfast and we then find out that Dudley is fucking obese. He is so fat that he takes up one side of the table and his school report says that he's a fat bully who is fat. His nurse gave him a diet and he's going to fucking die from being fat. They have to feed him grapefruits and lettuce and stuff because he's fat. The school nurse had seen what Petunia's eyes, so sharp when it came to spotting fingernails on her gleaming walls and in observing the comings and goings of the neighborhood, simply refused to see. That far from needing extra nourishment, Dudley had reached roughly the size and, and weight of a young killer whale. He's fat, get it? He's fat. That sentence is terrible. But it's, it's like she forgot to include that Petunia's eyes were sharp and just decided to shove it in later. You could just start like a sentence with that and then go on. Harry was forced into the diet as well as everyone else in the household because she said that the only way to make Dudley eat it is to make sure everyone else eats the same thing. So he wrote to his friends about it and they all sent him shit via owl, like cakes and sweets and other things with no nutritional value. He also got some meat pies that he stored under his floorboards for how long? And they didn't go bad? Does he have a fridge spell or a heat spell or something? There's more parentheses too, so have fun with that. They also sent him a cake on his birthday. After breakfast, Vernon corners Harry about a funky letter that they got in the mail with too many stamps and stuff. The Weasleys had sent it to ask for permission so Harry could go and see the sports ball thing. The letter is dumb and shows how stupid wizards are because they don't understand how letters work. They don't understand the idea that muggles aren't toddlers and wizards just have no concept of technology without using magic and they have a lack of common sense in general. They also don't have guns. Didn't Ron explain to them that Harry was in a kind of an abusive situation and he needs their help to make sure that they don't get mad at him for the weird wizard bullshit going on? Like they tried to starve him to death in the cage room. They could get Hermione to word the letter normally for them, I don't know. I mean, she's staying with them, isn't she? Other people might not understand why Uncle Vernon was making a fuss about so many stamps, but Harry had lived with the Dursleys long enough to know. We can tell, thanks, you don't have to say this in parentheses, no less. We can tell that they're bad. I can tell who the wrong sort are for myself, thanks. So Harry explains that he can go with them to go to the sports ball thing, and the Dursleys don't have to deal with him if he's gone. And he explains that they had seen the Weasleys when they took Harry to the train for the first time. He almost said Hogwarts Express, and that was a way to get his uncle's temper up. Nobody ever mentioned the name of Harry's school aloud in the Dursley household. Harry then sasses them a bit and manages to convince them that he can go, and he also uses Sirius as a threat to make them say yes. If he told Harry that he couldn't go to the Quidditch World Cup, Harry could write and tell Sirius, who would know Harry was being mistreated. They didn't let me go to sports ball. I am oppressed. Harry then goes up to his room and gets hit by an owl with ADHD. He sees that it has a letter from Ron who says that regardless of what the Dursleys said, they're coming to get him anyway. So this is just gonna be a repeat of the second book all over again. They're just gonna crash in and do what? So then he finishes his letter to Sirius and sends it off with a note that he's gonna be at Ron's, and also sends back a note to Ron saying that everything is gonna be okay for the cup. He had emptied his hiding place under the loose floorboard of all the food, double-checked every nook and cranny of his bedroom for forgotten spell books or quills, taken down the chart on the wall counting down the days to September 1st, on which he liked to cross off the days remaining until his return to Hogwarts. He liked to cross off the days on a calendar with marked days off to remember events. Imagine my shock! I've never seen this before. So he goes down and sees Vernon putting on his best suit, which Rowling likes to explain to us is to intimidate the people and show off his status to other men, even though we can tell by the way that he's doing this. And there's some food, well pretend food in parentheses so you know it's important. Normally Uncle Vernon would have asked what car Mr. Weasley drove. He tended to judge other men by how big and expensive their cars were. But then they wait and then the Weasleys just don't show up and then they hear screaming from inside of the blocks of fireplace. They use flu powder to attempt to come into the house and Harry explains that fire is electric because they don't have a real one they just use the, the fake one in the blocked off fireplace. Makes me ask if the flu powder network works off of chimney themselves and not just any random one like is there like a specific network or something even if you've never been to a place before you can tell that there's a chimney if you have the address and then just like suffocate in the roof <laughs> what are we doing here has something gone wrong oh no Ron came Fred's voice very sarcastically no this is exactly where we wanted to end up Every now and again, Rowling does have some really good jokes, and I like the 
the twin style of humor, but I feel like it's so rare that I have to point it out. Then they go on to say that there's a network for fireplaces and you can just hook people up to it without needing the consent of the person living at that address or the knowledge about it or even being there in person or anything, so who the fuck knows how that works? Ministry of being incompetent again. Fred and George then want to get Harry's stuff from upstairs because they're keen to see the fat cousin and they want to see how stupid and fat he is. Dudley's running around holding his ass because of that thing from the first book. Thanks for reminding us, Rowling, he's fat. Arthur is trying hard to make conversation with the adults and they clearly don't want to, but he's fucking autistic so he doesn't understand the muggle social cues, even though that's the sort of thing that's kind of universal, I assume. But then Harry says goodbye and the Dursleys ignore him and then Arthur gets fixated on this and decides to make a big deal about it. You aren't going to see your nephew until next summer, he said to Uncle Vernon in mild indignation. Surely you're gonna say goodbye. No, Arthur. Dudley then eats a candy that dropped out of Fred's pockets, even though he's fucking scared of wizards and is about Harry's age, so he's like 15 or 14 or something, and he's so cartoonishly fat and stupid that even though his arch enemy, the devil himself, a wizard, dropped a candy, he still eats it because he's fat. Even food on the floor from a stranger. If someone offered you candy in a van, oh my god. So his tongue gets super fat and it leaks out of his mouth and like just hangs out on the floor and he struggles to breathe because his tongue is suffocating him. And he almost gets suffocated to death and then he dies and then the police say execute all the wizards, Pinochet style. No, no, no. They watch for a while until they try to help him before he suffocates to death, and Arthur says that he'll sort it out and tells everyone to leave, or they'll laugh at a fat person suffocating to death. Harry gets introduced to the two older brothers who aren't there usually, Bill and Charlie. Bill is so cool because he dresses like fucking new metal fag. Then he finds out that Fred and George have been designing stuff for their business, a joke shop with lots of prank items. They want to own their own business one day, and reading this as an else who's also interested in that kind of thing. I, I It made me smile. I like it. Good job, boys. The problem that I have, don't muggles getting stuck in wizard traps constitute as a misuse of muggle artifacts, the part of the department that Arthur's involved in? Or like using magic on muggles, which is a law that is violated and then the ministry comes to fuck you up? It's like they need a squad called in for this kind of thing. Or does this not apply because Harry's relatives know magic so it doesn't matter? But in the third novel, Harry got in trouble for using magic and also in the fifth one he gets in trouble for doing that with them, when when the muggles were the only ones that, that would notice, the Dursleys, they would already know. Arthur sorted it out, I guess, and there's nothing wrong with the joke shop, but the suffocation candy is probably a bit much, isn't it? So then they leave Fred and George to be yelled at by the mum and they go upstairs. Percy has been working for the ministry and he's really into the politician life and the rules and discipline. He can't shut up about the smallest thing like a fucking bootlicker. Afterwards, they go up three more flights of stairs, so the house is confirmed to have more than four floors. Poor wizarding family indeed. Hermione and Ron have been so deeply involved in helping Sirius escape from the Ministry of Magic that they were almost as concerned about Harry's godfather as he was. They can't speak about it. I mean, it takes them so long to make a fucking code word. They just kind of look at each other funny. Isn't there also a law or something that you guys can figure out to make Sirius get another trial or something? You did that with Buckbeak last year. You did that with elf laws this year. So the ministry is this corrupt, what a dystopia, it's almost like the real world. Molly Weasley is also able to just make food appear from her wand as magic without any means of exchange that I can see, it just kind of appears. She's also mumbling about how if Fred and George keep going like this, they're going to get in trouble. If they carry on the way they're going, they'll end up in front of the improper use of magic office. Why haven't they already though? They almost killed someone. The Ministry has random knowledge about who does magic where until they don't. Bill and Charlie are fighting with table legs like, you know, sword fight style and they put them down and with a flick of his wand, Bill reattached the table leg and conjured tablecloths from nowhere. Ah yes, my favourite spell, the tablecloth infinity spell. They have dinner and Percy keeps trying to get people to ask about his stupid ministry job and how secret it is. Then they talk about how a Quidditch match once it went on for an entire week because this sport is completely insane. They have to get up early to make sure that they are on time, but the adults get to apparate or teleport in. There's places like Hogwarts where you can't just teleport in, unless you can, I guess. Depends on the plot. You can basically everywhere else though, it's just a teleportation spell. 
Harry knew that apparating meant disappearing from one place and reappearing almost instantly in another, but had never known any Hogwarts student to do it and understood it was very difficult. Very good, Harry. You're being very observant today. My god, that sentence is awful to look at. They also say that there's a registry of people who can teleport and when they're allowed to during government events. They know when you can do it without a license as well, so I guess they can detect that, like they can detect muggles having magic around them. There's also another term called splinched. This means that they end up torn up because some body parts are in one location and some are in another, but they get fused into the wall sometimes and stuff. That sounds very gory and, and like, you know, someone could die very easily but apparently they just survive they just get fully dissected and then a wizard shows up and then just like patches them back together the the irs just gives you a band-aid even though you got hit by a car and you're fine george tries to sneak in his murder suites into the quidditch grounds but his mom catches them several small brightly colored objects zoomed out of george's pocket he made a grab for them but missed and they sped right into mrs weasley's outstretched hand but how is he gonna get it through anyway if they have like the super secret screenings and all that shit? How does the security work when you bring shit into magical grounds? But as they go, Arthur explains security is a nightmare because wizards are fucking terrible at organizing big events and secrets, and the muggles are just muggles. People with cheap tickets have to come two weeks ahead of schedule to set up for this, so they're just hanging around on a field for two weeks. Which means that there's even more effort being put into trying to hide them for that additional two weeks. I don't know why this makes things better for them. There's a lot of different teleportation points and memory spells to use too, it seems like such a big hassle. They also introduced the port key, which is an object that transports you at a prearranged time to a prearranged location. And they usually disguise these as objects such as rubbish or litter in random locations. Like the one they're going to now is an old boot in a field with rubbish around it. So if a muggle finds it, I suppose they have a way of reversing it and erasing their memory. Well, not that they mentioned it. I just kind of made it up for them. They meet Diggory and Son. Harry was used to people looking curiously at him when they meet him, used to the way that their eyes moved at once to the lightning scar on his forehead, but it always made him feel uncomfortable. Thanks, Rowling. There's no other way that you could have shown us this. Thanks. So they teleport by all touching the boot and go to the Quidditch field on time to get their names marked off and set up the tents. They say that it can take two fucking weeks for the match to start. I just- I can't believe that. How the fuck are you supposed to make the field less noticeable if you're using it for a longer time? I'm sure muggles won't notice the port key or the wizard travel because they usually don't anyway, it's just a field. So if the field manager has it closed off, just go in there and be invisible and it's fine, I don't know. But they show up and a muggle who owns the field and like asks them what their name is so he can mark it off and then Arthur displays himself as a fucking idiot who doesn't know how to talk to people. How does a ministry official not know how to operate among muggles? He can't understand muggle currency either and then the muggle gets suspicious. You foreign, asked Mr. Roberts. Foreign, repeated Mr. Weasley, puzzled. Yeah, because you didn't prep your currency for the dude you knew you'd be talking to, you idiot. You look like you don't understand British currency. And then he starts getting all suspicious about the weirdos and their currency and everything. And then a fed shows up and has to erase his memory again. Obliviate, he said, sharply pointing his wand at Mr. Roberts. I don't see why he has to notice you. Like, you could just do this without him even knowing. Like, just make it- like, you have spells where it- a muggle goes up to a field and then because they're not supposed to be in there it just makes them think that they have some other thing they have to do and then they run off to prevent them from going into the field you could just make him think that he closed the field off and he doesn't need to use it whenever he approaches it and then just continue to use it without him knowing why do you keep this guy around harry recognized the symptoms of one who had just had his memory modified Thank you, Harry. You're so observant. The wizard then goes on to say that this happens frequently and says that the muggle needs a wizard charm 10 times a day to make him happy. Do you not get brain damage getting your memory fucked 10 times a day for three weeks? Does this not do anything to him? Not just a spell. It's like a mind altering thing or like even a physical altering thing. Like the, the character, the fake Mad-Eye Moody that's in this book, he takes Polyjuice Potion 
every single hour for an entire year, does that not like fuck up his body because of his organs rearranging and all that crap? The spell has zero impact and it feels like it's just nothing. I understand some things about magic being sneaky means that like people who don't know that magic exists will just not notice anything. I do understand that in some cases, but I think that the magic doesn't even feel like it, it does anything because it just fucks this guy's memory for weeks. And he, he doesn't get damaged at all, like, d does it even do anything? They even talk more about the re regulations of the magic during these events, so apparently wizards aren't allowed to use magic in the secret field. Which doesn't make sense because they're contained in the secret field, so it should be totally fine. And there's also magical whimsical merch being sold there as well, isn't that it's like somehow a violation of the magic that's not supposed to happen? He goes on to say, no magic allowed, strictly speaking, not when we're out in these numbers on Muggle land, but you're in like an invisible tent field thing. No one knows that you're there. Why didn't you set it up so that it like goes off if a muggle, like if, you know how you have like the field so that the muggle can't cross into the magic zone? Why don't you have it the other way around so you can do magic while in the zone, but if you cross the barrier, then you do magic it alerts the officials and they try to tell you to fuck off or something. But no, you're going out of your way to use more magic because of how stupid you're being, when you could be using less. You don't need to use magic 10 times a day on this dude to cause brain damage because he doesn't need to be there. When real muggles camp, they cook on fires outdoors. I've seen them do it. Arthur. Arthur. Is fire cooking an alien concept to you? How is this only a muggle concept? How is cooking food on the hot thing that makes the food cook a foreign concept to you people? Do wizards not know what barbecues are? I'm pretty sure that's a universal thing. Do you guys never camp? I don't understand how these guys even function being so dumb. They're setting up the camp while Arthur creams his pants about muggle camping and sends Harry and friends to go off get water from the pump because they're not allowed to use magic. Then they see other people clearly using magic. There's a small child inflating a slug <laughs> and he's, he's fine, he's not being sniped by the IRS. They also talk about who's playing, including Victor Crumb, a dude who's gonna be in the tournament later and he goes to school in Bulgaria. Apparently the Bulgarians are a bunch of crooked liars. He's one of them Quidditch protégés that goes to school and somehow Harry ends up flying better than him in the book because Harry is the best. At the water pump, they come across these wizards in muggle clothes who don't understand how to fucking wear pants. Is this how magic works? Y you need brain damage. I mean, pants are kind of self-explanatory, aren't they? I bought this in a muggle shop, said an old wizard seriously. Muggles wear them. Muggle women wear them, Archie, not the men. They wear these. In 2020, that's, that's illegal to say how problematic I'm literally shaking and shitting and pissing right now. After this, Harry is talking about magic schools because it just occurred to him that other countries have other magic schools. And Ron talks about how this one time, Bill got a pen pal from Brazil who got so offended that Bill wouldn't come and visit Brazil that he sent a hex in the mail. So they return from the water pump and Arthur is failing to set up camp because Arthur is stupid. Oops, he said as he managed to light a match and promptly dropped it in surprise. Arthur, you fucking idiot. It's literally just a stick. It's not hard. Oh my god, how do you not know how matches work? There's also a former sports ball player who works for the government now, and he shows up being fun and kind of sketchy. Nice parentheses, bitch. Fred and George start gambling with him, and then they mention that they can't spare anyone else to do anything at the ministry right now because of the numbers of the Quidditch match. So they don't want to go and look for the lady who's possibly dead somewhere. You see, everyone has gone to watch sports ball and they need the numbers here, not looking for the lady who died. No one cares about a fed getting fucked up somewhere. They start talking about magic carpets and Barty Krupp mentions that they're considered a muggle item and can't be used for magical purposes because it would be considered misuses of mug muggle artifacts. I almost said muggle. What the fuck? What the fuck is a muggle? You guys use radios, telephone boxes, plumbing, you have a band playing during the ball later in the book, you have cars, buses, other enchanted instruments, you use silverware. Why are carpets different? Where's the line drawn between what can be enchanted and what can't in the ministry? Why are carpets which, which were originally used in magic outlawed nowadays and brooms are totally fine. 
There's something also going on at Hogwarts, but they don't tell the students because it's a, it's a surprise. It's the death match. Harry then buys something called the Omnioculars that replay things, slow things down, play by play, break down. They're basically VR camera things. It's it's weird, but it honestly makes me question. They clearly have camera technology, like cameras themselves, and then they have these things. It it's like stuff that implements the idea of cameras. Like they have the technology that they can like Frankenstein into magical items. So it's it's like magic tech from other high fantasy things but it's not quite because she doesn't really follow through with it a lot like they could easily have some sort of cctv going on because of like a magic tech way to do it but they just don't even though that would really help them with a lot of like crime solving and then ron wants a pair of them and then harry buys it for him and then ron gets like pissed off because he's poor he was always touchy about the fact that harry who had inherited a small fortune from his parents had much more money than he did Every time muggles have gone anywhere near all year, they've suddenly remembered urgent appointments and have to dash away again. This is them basically confirming the thing that I said before about how muggles don't go into the magical field while the wizards are using it so they don't see the wizards. I don't see why you need the muggles outside to know about this and use memory charms on them all day. So they go to the top box for the prime spots during the match, and Harry sees a house elf that he thinks is Dobby, but it is one called Winky who belongs to Mr. Crouch, the ministry man from earlier. The fact that these sentient creatures are slaves, but they have immense power, just brings more questions than answers about like what they were before they got enslaved, or if there was a war, or... I don't know. It's never gonna be fucking... If anything, it'll only ever be addressed in Fantastic Beasts if they want to shoehorn it in, and it wouldn't make sense because I fucking hate Fantastic Beasts, and it, it just retcons everything. There's also this really awkward side plot that starts where Hermione thinks that the house elves are badly mistreated, which I mean they are, and the house elf explains to her that slavery is good for them and freedom is shameful, and they like working to the bone because it's in their nature to do that, and that Dobby has been excommunicated from the rest of the elves because he's talking about having rights and it's bad that he wants freedom. The fact that the broken English the elves are speaking in reminds me of like minstrel cartoons just makes it very awkward for me to read. <laughs> freedom is going to Dobby's head, sir, said Winky. Ideas above his station, sir. Come can't get another position, sir. Apparently, if house elves speak out too much, they get put in front of the magical creatures being shitbags department. Is there a different department for ones that aren't sentient? Like, do goblins and vampires show up to this department as well? That's a bit awkward. The minister himself shows up and is having trouble communicating with the Bulgarian minister because translators don't exist, I guess. You'd think that the first thing that they would do is to get a translator for the diplomatic relations going on right now, but I, I don't know. Malfoy then shows up and is mean as usual right in front of the minister who's so dumb that he doesn't see what's going on. Then the mascots for the team show up. Ireland has leprechauns and then the Bulgarians send in Vila. Vila were the most beautiful women that Harry had ever seen because they're basically sirens, I guess. And then he starts walking off the rail as if he's going to jump off. I th you'd think that they'd prepare for that or something, like to not be liable if someone dies falling to try and simp for the Vila. The match then starts and there's a bunch of interference from the mascots and it's a mess. Quidditch itself seems like a mess and there's a ref that starts fighting with the mascots because the Bulgarians are being cheeky again. Unless I'm much mistaken, Mustafa is actually attempting to send off the Bulgarian mascots, said Bagman, said Bagman's voice as opposed to what is butthole. Now there's something we haven't seen before. Oh, this could turn nasty. So they left the mascot on the, the field to be idiots, even though they know that the magical creatures will start fucking shit up on the field. And then they, they get angry when the mascots start fucking shit up on the field. Just send them off anyway. Send them off when the match begins. Also, I wonder if you could tell that someone's gay by the way that they react to the Vila, though, because the women don't react to it, but the men do. So it's like, I wonder... <laughs> I wonder. Also, Ireland wins. The Bulgarian minister reveals that he can speak English the entire time, but he was just having a laugh at the stupid British man. Politics, ladies and gentlemen. So they go back to the tents, and there's almost a three line long parenthesis. Oh my lord. As they're going back to bed and drifting in out of sleep, talking to each other about the match, the magic Nazis show up. Somehow, even though there was so much security around, and I don't know how the magic ministry shit works or whatever. They're hooded and they have masks on, and they're also fucking with people and floating them around. 
The floating people were suddenly illuminated as they passed over a burning tent, and Harry recognized one of them as Mr. Roberts. Why is he here? Why does he need to be here? All the other wizards, including the Ministry wizards, are doing fuck all about the bad guys. It looked as though they were scared to perform any spell that might make the Roberts family fall. I think it, I'm pretty sure in the third book, Dumbledore conjured an entire stretcher from nothing when Harry fell during the the Quidditch match when he got attacked by the, the Dementors. Why can't these wizards do that when they're ministry trained? Or like just, I don't know, anything? So then the adults go off to help other people while the kids are instructed to go run to the evacuation spot in the woods. So while they're off doing that, the Malfoy gang walks past them looking all smug. Have it your way, Potter, said Malfoy, grinning maliciously. If you think they can't spot a mudblood, stay where you are. No, no, really, please elaborate. Do they have racial purity spells or something? How does anything in the the Nazi wizard thing work? Like, I, I know it's the dark times and a lot of that shit's taboo, but I would like some sort of understanding about muggle racial warfare. And then Hermione decides now is a good time to start going off at the wizarding world for how bad they treat house elves, even though they could die at any moment. Because then they see Winky going by and Harry realizes he doesn't have his wand. They passed a group of goblins who were cackling over a sack of gold that they had undoubtedly won, betting on the match, and who seemed quite unperturbed by the trouble at the campsite. I wonder if they'll end up in the magical creature's office later. Hermione's like, wow, I can't believe all of the shit happening where the entire ministry is here tonight. I don't know, most of the ministry fucks up pretty badly, so I'd imagine it's pretty easy to do all this shit while the entire ministry is here tonight. And then they see a star-spangled skull in the sky, which means the Washington special tree is back in business. What's the matter? Harry asked, startled to see her face so white and terrified. It's the dark mark, Harry, Hermione moaned, pulling him as hard as she could. You know whose sign? Harry. I'm sure... I'm pretty sure that a giant skull appearing in the sky means something bad is happening. Especially if people are screaming and dying in the background because everything is on fire. Maybe, just maybe if you use your thinking cap, assume that something bad is happening. Then the ministry shows up and they think the kids did something because they're stupid. Even though they also explained that the spell that the man did was something that only Death Eaters and powerful wizards who understand the way that the, the Nazi wizards work are capable of doing something like this. And the fact that Harry is with them and Harry is like the anti-Voldemort. They find Winky with Harry's wand and they do a spell that can show the last thing that the wand did. That's fucking new, isn't it? And it shows that the skull spell was indeed done using Harry's wand. But then Winky, after they revive her using the revive spell, wasn't able to do that because non-humans aren't allowed to carry wands. And I don't know how hell self magic works besides the fact that it kind of just does whatever the fuck it wants. And that's something we'll never know more about. And there's a spell... I made a joke about delete earlier. I forgot that there was a spell called delete. There's a spell called delete to erase, to erase a spell rolly, that's just backspace. But Mr. Crouch gets cranky as if they're accusing him of causing the mark, even though they're just asking him what happened, so he's clearly hiding something. And then he just kind of cleans up and sends them home. They're walking back to the tent and Hermione starts going on about everyone hating house elves, even though they're still in the middle of a danger terrorist attack and now is not the time. Even fucking autistic Arthur Weasley has enough of her bullshit. Hermione, I agree with you, said Mr. Weasley quickly, beckoning her on, but right now is not the time to discuss elf rights. I want to get back to the tent as fast as we can. Arthur also explains that there was like a doom symbol for the, the dark mark, which it, they mark in the sky when they've killed someone at that location. If they've killed someone and you see the skull, you keep away from that area because it comes like stigmatized. Half the muggle killings back when you know who was in power were done for fun. I suppose they had a few drinks tonight and couldn't resist reminding us that lots of them were still at large. A nice little re reunion for them, he finished disgustedly. So they get to the tent, they fall asleep, and as they're leaving, they find out that Robert had to have his brain blasted so badly to forget everything that happened last night that he thinks that it's Christmas now. So he does have brain damage, but apparently it'll just magically fade away after a while because fuck knows how that works. Sometimes when a person's memory is modified, it makes them a bit disoriented for a while, and that was a big thing they asked him to forget. And then after that, they introduce Wizard CNN, aka like a, a shitty tabloid that the Daily Prophet has become, 
and how it's gonna blame them for everything, which I mean, honestly, they kind of did fuck it up a bit. And then there's Rita Skeeter, who is basically like the, you know, certain individuals who like to dox people in real life for like saying things that they disagree. And she makes up a bunch of crap about them and the go the ministry just allows it even though they all hate her. Like, it's, it's not like she's just saying things that you don't like. She's like, sometimes she says things that is like libel. Last week, she was saying that we're wasting our time quibbling about cauldron thickness when we should be stamping out vampires. I mean, she is right in that point, isn't she? You never address vampires unless it's convenient. Like, they just kind of exist somehow. It's like dragons. They just exist, even though they're fucking massive and, like, kill everyone. Then Harry is kind of nervous because he is still thinking about the big old skull in the sky because it's spooky. And Arthur has to prep for damage control because CNN is here. Well, father feels like he's got to make up for his mistake at the match, doesn't he? said Percy. If truth be told, he was a tad unwise to make a public statement without clearing it with his head of department. Don't you blame your father for what that wretched Skeeter woman wrote, said Mrs. Weasley. So Arthur has rushed off already, even though they're back home and he barely has had time to sleep, he's off to do damage control, Percy starts bootlicking, and remember this specific point, Molly Weasley thinks that the CNN journalist is a piece of shit and full of lies because how she writes a libel about bull that Molly personally knows, and Molly knows for a fact that this woman is writing libel. Because she fucking changes her tune on it later on, I'll tell you. So then Ron gets shown some gross dress robes that he has to wear during the prom this year because wizards don't know what tuxedos are. So they're off to Hogwarts now and Arthur is explaining how a great aura, the basically the wizard SWAT fed named Mad-Eye Moody was attacked or something by someone and the muggles even noticed because of the hullabaloo and they tried to call the police. The wizards themselves don't seem to even know the word police. I mean, I'm not surprised considering how horrible their own authorities are in this world and how incompetent the government is, but it's just strange that they don't know these basic structures. I'm pretty sure it was mentioned in one of the later books that the prime minister, like the muggle prime minister himself, knows that wizards exist and they have to keep the higher-ups of the government informed, so you would think that both both parties have a decent understanding of how each other's governments works if they themselves work in the government. Arthur's the only one who can get Mad-Eye Moody up. Oh, can he now? Is that what he does when he goes to work early? Molly is just okay with this, is she? Anyways, what's going on is this. Mad-Eye is basically a Vietnam vet wizard who sometimes gets delusions about being attacked when he's not really because he's like semi-retired and he has a good reputation of being a legend but has also become very paranoid and is just like needs he needs a good nap and he sees plots to kill him everywhere he's a bit loony but he's always been one of my favorite characters and I still like him basically Arthur is one of those people who knows him and knows how to calm him down however this time they seem to have an actual attack that has happened so they need to figure out what's going on especially because he will be their defense against the dark arts teacher this year, even though the kids don't know that yet. The kids also have to get to the station early with all of this big mess going on, because the only way to enter Hogwarts station seems to be through platform 9 and 3 quarters, even though it would seem a hell of a a lot more efficient to have flu networks and apparition spots or anything for that kind of thing since they're not in Hogwarts themselves they're just at, on the train it just seems very inefficient to have one train station spot also Hermione is still going on about the elf thing I, I mean I get it I get it you're you're not helping though also apparently Bulgaria is evil because of black magic can't wait to see what my hometown is like then. Hermione explains that there's charms over the wizard school that show muggles an empty field or a bunch of barren wastelands or something to ward them away from going there. Which makes sense to me, but why don't they just use those during the World Cups and other stuff and leave it at that? Seem to work for those schools. It's bewitched, said Hermione. If a muggle looks at it, all they see is a mouldering old ruin with a sign over the entrance saying, Danger, do not enter. Unsafe. Fat lot of help that does them sometimes. Also, Malfoy decides to show up on the train and make fun of Ron's ADHD owl, but it doesn't really matter. Malfoy must have some kind of contract to show up at the train in this exact spot every single book. Get a hobby, please. But Malfoy also is deciding that because Death Eaters from the fourth book onwards are basically slowly being more comfortable with being out and about and showing that they're Death Eaters, he gets a lot more comfortable with insinuating this. Um, of course, Dumbledore knows all of this, but he just kind of goes with it anyways. So they go in to the school and Peeves, the poltergeist, is being a nuisance, of course, because he also has a contract to do that every single book. His description kind of reminds me of Heaven's Door. It's only a matter of time before he kills someone. 
I say this every single time, but seriously, how is he allowed in this school? He has definitely murdered someone. There's more emphasis that Slytherins are all Satan as well in this book, of course, and Peeves tried to fuck up the kitchen before the feast as well. Hermione then decides to make a big deal about the slave elves working in the kitchens. What did she think happened before the food just appeared? I know that's what magic does in this world, but it's not that bad. Rolling, you're killing me with these parentheses though. Then, just as they're wondering where the dark arts teacher is for this year, a dull clunk echoed through the hall on his every other step. He reached the end of the table, turned right, and limped heavily towards Dumbledore. They always make a scene, these ones. So Mad-Eye is now at Hogwarts, and it is revealed to everyone that the Triwizard Tournament is now being held this year. This is where kids compete in various dangerous things to get all the good sports ball points and win the cup between three wizarding schools as a show of alliance between them. Alliance probably about killing children. There's a champion from each of them and in the times before they were death toll. The death toll was so high that it got cancelled. Are you surprised? No. So then Neville makes a fool of himself because he has to do that every single book and they all go to bed. Wait, where's the rest of the dorm rooms? Where's the other ones? Where does everyone else sleep? Is Harry's current year the only one that gets the bed? So they get back to their bullshit classes and one of them is about boob tubers? And then one of the students recounts how someone tried to hex off their acne and they had a horrible accident where their nose came off but Madame Pomfrey fixed her nose back on the end. Does no one have organ damage in this world? Are their organs on for decoration? Is that why there's no consequences when they fall off? Hagrid also introduces some more dangerous things that can burn the students because of course he does. And then they go to divination and there's more talk about how it's a quack science that isn't legit. But honestly, it's just as legit as any other crap in this world. So I don't really know why divination in and of itself is something that is seen as like a bad thing that doesn't work. Malfoy also turns up again and tries to talk shit and then tries to hex Harry when Harry's back is turned because he's a coward. Several people screamed. Harry felt something white hot graze the side of his face and then Mad-Eye Moody turns up and turns Malfoy into a ferret and bounces him around and then McGonagall tells him off and everyone has a good day. The next two weeks passed without great incident unless you counted the weird use of you occasionally in this book that doesn't really feel that great and shouldn't have been in the sentence. They finally have Mad-Eye Moody's class and everyone is super into Mad-Eye Moody because he's like super cool and he likes to teach them dangerous things that the other people don't and he talks about how there's three major taboo curses. The Killing Curse, which is the gun spell, the Cruciatus Curse, which is like the evil pain spell, and that Imperial curse where you mind control people. He's also going to inflate a spider to show how this works. There's no way to tell if people are under the imperial curse or not as far as they know. They need to interview people in order to figure out if the person was really under the curse or if they were following orders because they enjoyed doing so. First, he makes uh, the spider bigger using Ingorgio. I wonder if you can just do that without causing someone great pain. Like, if you use it on a human and they become a giant, is there gonna be some issue there or are they just a giant now? He uses the torture curse on the spider and Neville gets PTSD because we aren't told this just yet, but that's how his parents got fucked up when they were tortured for information by the Death Eaters and they are now in an asylum and they don't even remember him. Which is really fucked up and it's... I, I do like Neville's character quite a lot, I make jokes about him, but I do think that we'll get into this later in another, in like when it turns up in the seventh book, but I do think they mistreated him quite a lot in the in the movies, and I feel like I like his character. Sometimes I like him more than Harry, honestly. Neville looked even more frightened at the prospect of tea with Moody. He neither moved nor spoke. Moody turned his magical eye on Harry. So after Neville got upset and the class ended, Moody invites him to cheer him up and presumably gives him that book that teaches him about like magical creatures that he can help Harry with later in the second task. But Neville comes back later with his book and he's happy because Moody told him about how good they think he is at herbology. Now we can guess from this that Moody is trying to cheer him up and also give him a leg up in some of the subjects that he's good at to try and boost his self-confidence because the teacher wants to be supportive. However, Rowling decides that we can't make this up on our own because we are stupid and decides that Harry needs to say this for us. Telling Neville that what Professor Sprout had said, Harry thought, had been a very tactful way of cheering Neville up. 
Thank you, Harry never would have guessed. But Rowling throughout the book continues to do so. But she also brings up a lot of implications about what Nazi wizards are doing, which really does interest me because that form of like creepy torture magic is really fucking freaky to me. But she doesn't really go further with it. On the face of it, implication alone is totally fine if you want to make like a horror book. And in some ways, it's actually better than full on telling us because the implication allows the fear of the unknown for the, the reader to kind of tailor fit the experience to their own terrifying, you know, things floating around in their head. I get that. The same with my gripe of Stephen King saying that he shouldn't explain anything and then he goes on to over explain some things and he makes terrible decisions in some of his books, I'll get to that another time. In the same vein, it works the same way with Rowling because she writes a world that really isn't consistent and we still need like the base information upon which to build something that the implications will take us to and it doesn't really work here because the thing is, alright, you've got the three taboo spells. You've got the death spell, the torture spell, and the mind control spell. However, love potions still exist and those can basically do a mind control thing in the sense that you can like sexually assault someone or mind control them in a different type of way. Or you could use like polyjuice potion which seems incredibly taboo but it's just kind of available at Hogwarts, even though some of these are banned, people still sneak them in. And they seem bad or even worse than the Imperious Curse in the first place. There's also the cheering charm which was mentioned in like book two, where it makes you happy and it makes you smile, which also seems really disturbing because there's an implication that there's other emotion causing spells. So I, I just feel like there's not enough information about why the Nazi spells are worse because it seems like they're just kind of taking these things that still exist in the world and like arbitrarily being like, no, but the way that these guys do it is bad, even though it seems like you can easily do it in worse ways. So there's other spells that exist that can really fuck with someone in the ways that are really bad, if not worse. And I don't really see what makes the Death Eaters stick out so much other than them just being classified as evil. Also, Wizard Forensics is basically non-existent and Sirius isn't free, so how does anyone even keep up with these things? Not only that, but it seems like as soon as Voldemort started getting more power, I guess the Death Eaters that work within the Ministry slowly got into being evil and following his orders and like converting the Ministry into being the, the Voldemort zone. Because Dumbledore in the first and second book is loved at the Ministry and then halfway through the second book when Malfoy decides that he needs to be taken down, they just suddenly don't like him because Malfoy randomly got power and then they bring him back because they love him again. And then in the third book it's okay because they kind of like him again but not enough to free Sirius I guess? And then at the end of the fourth one they just think he's a madman and then in the sixth one he's dead anyway. I don't even know what's going on. I just don't understand how these spells are classified, or how any of the Death Eaters manage to get around so quickly. Dumbledore, at the end of the book, seems like he doesn't even know Moody was a fake, but I feel like Dumbledore has mentioned that he can see through po like potions and spells before, so I don't know what he knows. I do think that the angle that Rowling is going for is that Voldemort has infiltrated the Ministry and he is essentially using the Minister and the actual Death Eaters as a way to control the government. I do see that. However, it really doesn't work because of the general incompetence of the Ministry and how inconsistent the dangers of the magic are in this world. It doesn't land in the way that it should. If the spells and the magic were better explained and there were better examples with how the government worked to begin with, it would definitely be terrifying. Like I, I really do understand what she's going for and I appreciate it a lot, but I don't think it lands. Anyway, <laughs> Harry and Ron have homework to predict their week from divination and they decide because Trawny doesn't really seem to care if they really did try to predict their futures or not, she kind of just wants them to write something very grim for the week because it seems like the more sad it is, the more she thinks that it's real, a real prediction. They start having fun with that. And then Hermione gets offended at Ron's use of house elf oppression. And Sirius finally gets back to Harry. I'm flying north immediately. The news about your scar is the latest in a series of strange rumors that have reached me here. If it hurts again, go straight to Dumbledore. I'm just gonna ignore how we don't understand how owl interception works or how Sirius got his letter in or how the owls know how to find it. Ron is also as confused as me. Good, good Ron. Dumbledore knows the signs of what? And he doesn't even do anything about it anyway. Dumbledore is fucking useless. 
Early next morning, Harry woke with a plan fully formed in his mind, as though his sleeping brain had been working on it all night. Firstly, that sentence is quite awful, but Harry is gonna lie to Sirius that his head had no hurty after all, because he doesn't want Sirius to get caught by coming back into the area. Also, if he turned into a dog during his stay at Azkaban, because he mentioned in the third book that he managed to avoid getting the soul sucked out of him by the Death Eaters, I mean, the Death Eaters, the fucking, um, what are they called? The fucking goth cloak sucky boys. The, the Dementors, because he turned into a dog. Surely the guards at Azkaban would have seen him turn into a dog and they would have had that info if there was a giant black dog walking around that it was serious. They would have known, even if he's not registered as an animagus, they would have like figured it out, I think. This wouldn't be an issue if he just got taken to court properly, right? Peeves also decides to be shoved into a parenthesis as well. So he goes up and he writes his lie letter and then he comes back out and tells his friends what happened. That was a lie, Harry, said Hermione sharply over breakfast when he told her and Ron what he had done. You didn't imagine your scar hurting and you know it. Very good, Hermione. Lie be when no truth truth make up thing. Anyway, they go back to Moody's uh, new class and he's teaching them how to throw off the Imperial curse. Of course, Harry is the only one who can fight off the curse because he is a special boy. Look at that, you lot. Potter fought. He fought it and he damn near beat it. We'll try that again, Potter, and the rest of you pay attention. Watch his eyes. That's where you see it. So he puts Harry through the spell until he can throw it off completely, which Rowling decides, even though this is a mage mation that will come back later in the finale, deserves to be shoved into a parenthesis. They get a fuck ton of work to do because schools suck and then they notice that the other schools are showing up to stay at Hogwarts. The French school and the Bulgarian school to be exact. The teachers are on edge and they want to impress the other schools so everyone tries to clean up the castle and decides to bully Neville for just trying his best. Longbottom, kindly do not reveal that you can't even perform a, a simple switching spell in front of everyone from Durmstrang. How did he transplant his ears onto a cactus and he's fine? Organs not real. So Amini decides that she is going to make elf lives matter real and she starts around trying to make people buy badges that say spew on them and talk about elf issues despite the fact that she has never even spoken to any of them besides Winky and doesn't understand the situation that they're in to the extent that she can actually craft real goals that are achievable to help them. I do think that the situation is disturbing, how they want to be slaves and everything, and Hermione somehow does not make me want to be on her side because of her savior complex. Then Fred and George say, and we've met them and they're happy, they think it's the best job in the world. That's because they're uneducated and brainwashed, Hermione began hotly. Listen, Hermie, can I call you Hermie? Hizzle my nizzle? You're not helping. The elves have it good in Hogwarts compared to the rest of the world because Dumbledore gives them good shelter and doesn't abuse them. That's the only way that you're gonna start educating them. If you speak to them nicely and give them achievable goals that don't seem as drastic as just like shoving them into a completely different situation. For example, their workplaces at Hogwarts should be the standard because of the, the good living arrangements, the lack of abuse, in exchange for their hard work and not something super out of their comfort zone yet. And the way that you can phrase this to them is like, if you have comfier living spaces, you can get more done. You have a more efficient work schedule. You'll end up doing more respectable work. If you phrase it like that to them, then they'll start trying to, you know, figure out if what you're saying works with their own beliefs and then they might agree with you. You work in baby steps and then you can get other people on board as well by just approaching them in a way that doesn't make it look like you're trying to attack them. I just, I, if I was in this book, I would just give Hermione a fucking slap and like seriously try and talk to her about this thing because she has no idea what she's doing. So Sirius gets back to them and says that he doesn't believe Harry and also says that they need to keep changing owls, which makes me want to start talking about owl interception again, but I said that I wouldn't. So they all get lined up for the entrance of the other schools on the grounds. Hermione then points out again how they have to come in by train or ship because you can't teleport inside the grounds unless you can. Then the French school comes in with a giant flying carriage. A massive carriage. Remember in the second book when Harry and Ron made a massive scene because of the tiny flying car on the way to school? And there was so much risk about being spotted and sending out wizards to erase memories? How the fuck did they hide this long enough to not cause a scene or at least block some airspace? There's two parentheses on the next page too, and they're both bits of description that she squeezes in instead of making proper sentences for, even though I think they're pretty important. The French kids then get out and a giant lady that Hagrid will have romance times with comes out 
as well. In the movie, they make these kids girls and all the Bulgarians boys, even though these schools are co-ed in the books. I don't know why this is a thing and I cannot stand for this femboy erasure any longer. And then as Hagrid takes the horses away from the French school, the lake starts bubbling and a giant ship comes out with all of the evil Bulgarians. I keep forgetting the Bulgarian professor's name and when I try and type it I get lazy and I keep spelling it wrong in the script so I'm just gonna call him Linda. Linda has a fruity, unctuous voice because he's a fa- Ron is also nutting because Victor is in the Bulgarian school and he looks super cool and he does all the sports ball. The French students are staying in the castle and Victor is sitting with the Slytherins which makes Ron angry because Malfoy looks happy. The French people are all haughty and don't like the castle, so Ron doesn't like them until one of the pretty girls shows up to ask for their dish and he starts simping after her. After this, Harry simps too when he spots the girl that he has suddenly has a crush on, and then they notice that the Ministry is here to watch the game. They're also going to bring out the casket, which is the goblet, and it invites students to put their names in for the next 24 hours. They have the necessary arrangements for each challenge. Really? Really, I don't think they can manage that because they always seem to fuck it up, don't they? I will be drawing an age line around the Goblet of Fire once it has been placed in the entrance hall. Nobody under the age of 17 will be able to cross the line. You say that. Linda is also a meanie, so the other students as well, so he's really being set up for the big bad, isn't he? But he, he is Bulgarian, and he's talking to a Bulgarian student. Shouldn't they be talking in Bulgarian? Weird. Almost like he's using English to his students purely so that Harry can listen in and inform the audience what's going on. Meanwhile, Fred and George have an aging potion to get them over the line so that they can compete. Fuck knows why this is a thing or any impl implications of how aged lines or aging potions could be used in bars and clubs to get inside, but you know. So they're gonna use one drop each, said George, rubbing his hands together with glee. We only need to be a few months older. Of course this doesn't work because Dumbledore's age line is magic magic and they grow beards and start laughing about it and Dumbledore gives no fucks and sends them to the hospital. Harry and Cole go watch everyone put their names in as well and start speculating over the, who they think the Hogwarts champion will be. A cloud of live bats was fluttering around the enchanted ceiling. Imagine the amount of shit that drops on all of the food in the students' heads as they eat then. So afterwards they go to Hagrid who is trying to group himself for the tall woman. Godspeed, Hagrid. Tonight will be the announcement of all of the names, and Hagrid was supposed to walk up with them, but he seems to have his mind on other things. Hagrid also tries to explain to Hermione about why house elf spew things won't work, but she doesn't understand because she has a savior complex. It'll be doing them an unkindness, Hermione. It's in their nature to look after humans. That's what they like, see? You'd be making them unhappy if you took away their work and insulting them if you tried to pay them. This also brings up weird implications for, the, like, they have big powers that they apparently can't use unless a human lets them. This makes me think that there was some kind of massive war where the humans like subjugated them somehow and created like a, a weird ritual spell that made them humans basically can control the magic that they have for some reason. I really want to know more but I know I'm not gonna get it. Hermione is refusing to see why any of her solutions won't work unless they start with baby steps. I can't believe I'm having such a bizarre conversation in, in the Harry Potter book but here we go. Hagrid then decides to ditch them to go to the castle with his big GF and the others have to go up on their own. So now they finally get to see the chosen champions from the goblet. Nothing can go wrong. It vomits out the name Victor, Fleur, one of the pretty girls that Ron was simping after from the French group, and Cedric from Hufflepuff. Two of the girls who had not been selected had dissolved into tears and were sobbing with their heads on their arms. That's the French for you. Then the goblet goes mental when Harry's name comes out. Oh, okay, this brings up a lot of questions. For one, the age line doesn't even matter when you can just get someone else to put your name in, apparently. So what's the point of having it? Wouldn't there be other people watching or like charmed statues or portraits watching to make sure that, that everyone does things according to the rules to make sure that an older student doesn't put someone else's name in? Like the, the doorway to get into each of the houses in Hogwarts, you have to go to a portrait and say what the password is. So why don't they just use these portraits to like watch people? They seem to do that to guard other things. The portraits guard passageways and stuff. There are portraits in the Great Hall. Why don't you just move them closer and they can tell you if someone does something to fuck it up. It's basically like CCTV because these guys refuse to use magic tech CCTV. And 
Moody's entire pl well, fake Moody's entire plot would have not come to fruition because they would have seen him put his ha putting Harry's name in or something. How does the goblet even work? Does it just cycle through names like a bingo thing? Or does it even tell- can it even tell if names aren't eligible? So Harry gets up and goes to the place where the champions are meeting because Dumbledore insists and then the the wizard people, I mean the ministry people come in and they're like, I don't think there's any ducking out at this stage, it's down in the rules. I understand the idea on the face of it, but it's ridiculous when they have someone whose presence breaks the rules, even there, unable to be taken out of the competition because that would break the rules too. There's no bowing out, but he shouldn't be there in the first place. I understand like if a champion is selected like normally and then they they want to bow out but they can't because of like a magical pact that the goblet causes when it pulled their name out but harry's name shouldn't be in there and your fantasies can't ever be quenched can they so dumbledore had come in and sees harry is confused because someone else put his name in the other champions think he put his name in because he wants to be the center of attention and believes that he faked it somehow well barty knows the rules back to front barty you work at the ministry can you please explain the rules to me Please, gotta give our champions their instructions, haven't we, Barty? Want to do the honors? Barty, please explain. So then Moody comes in and suggests that someone put Harry's name into the goblet because they want to kill him by doing something with the task. This would be a good reason to have the portraits give testimony if they were placed to inside to watch over the tourney themselves. And it could also have been like an interesting plot point, like a, a Danganronpa-esque thing where they have to interview everyone to try and figure out which of the portraits is compromised or not. Also, can you hex the people inside the portraits? Like, if you have a portrait and you like cast a spell to give the person warts. Can the person inside the portrait be counted as a real person who is affected because they're sentient and they seem to be able to like move inside the pocket dimension of the portraits? Can you rig an alarm so that if someone covers a portrait you get notified if the portrait is like a guard? Can you erase the memory of a person in a portrait? Can you somehow use spells on humans on the portrait people? Harry then decides to think about who put his name into the goblet. Was Moody just being his usual paranoid self? Couldn't someone have put Harry's name in the goblet as a trick? A practical joke? Did anyone really want him dead? Yes. Harry is then allowed to leave, so he goes to the common room and no one listens to him trying to explain why this is a bad thing and he didn't do this. They're all saying how awesome it is for a person from Gryffindor to get in and completely ignoring any of the other implications. Harry then goes up to bed to find where Ron is. Harry suddenly became aware that he was still wearing the Scarlet Gryffindor banner that Lee had tied around him. Ron sees this and thinks that Harry's also in on it, and he gets really angry because he's sick of living in Harry's shadow all the time. Ron then asks how his name got in the goblet in the first place. I don't know, said Harry. He felt it would sound very melodramatic to say, to kill me. Ron's eyebrows rose so high that they were in danger of disappearing into his hair. I do understand that Ron would be angry. It doesn't matter if it really makes sense or not because he's a teenager and having him be angry at this seems perfectly fine to me, even if I would not think so because he's 14. When we're 14, we do stupid things, I get it. However, the way that it's written in this it just always bugged me because Ron at first seems to not believe Harry even though he's been through a lot of hijinks with Harry in the first place and you know I get that he can have his little you know time of the month you know rage but afterwards he just gets mad when Harry like flies around the dragon and then the he beats the first task Ron is just like haha I'm suddenly not mad anymore he he fecal funny out of nowhere and it just feels like Ron is like being a Todd which I mean that's normal for Ron but I mean Ron needs a bit of um, human emotions. I feel like him being mad would be a very interesting plot point because we've never seen them fight properly before like this. We've seen Hermione and Ron fight all the time but we've never seen Ron and Harry fight in this way and I, I like it. I like that it's in the book. I think it needs to be in the book. This whole series is just like there's potential and I loved it as a kid but I'm just really frustrated that the potential is wasted as an adult you know what i mean anyway the reason why i had to split it into two videos this time is because as we get towards the end of the series we start getting bigger books and i realized while i was writing all my notes for these that the notes that i had were like three times the size of the notes that i had for the previous video that i did on 
the Azkaban one. So I really do have to split this up for clarity's sake. I don't think that any of the things that I'm saying would make quite as much sense if I put it all into one video in like a rushed kind of manner because I do really love doing the series and I want to put my time into it and I want to try and make my criticisms as clear as possible because this the whole franchise was really my childhood and I have a lot to say on it. I don't know if I'll do the next one as the next video or if I'll have another video in between but that is happening. I'm just trying to work on it. The next- I think this will only have two parts and then I'll move on to the Phoenix one. I think the next part would be longer though because I still have like 60% left of the book but I think I wanted to cut it off here because specifically because of the tournament about to start and I think that would be a good way to cut it off. In any case, that's all I have for you today. So, bye now.